Welcome to Big Fish Stories, the podcast dedicated to telling the real outdoor stories of adventure, hunting, and fishing. For the outdoors men and women who get lost in the stories around the campfire, this is the place for you. My name is Tyler Hendricks, located in the great state of Idaho, and today I have with me the only person I could imagine having our first podcast, the man who introduced me to it all, my father, Michael Hendricks. How's it going today? Good, Ty. How are you? Doing good. Are you feeling nervous? No, I'm 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 good with this. Good. Except for I have to share some pretty uh we have a, we have one really embarrassing story that we have to share. But a lot of people have heard it, but everyone always asks the details of it. But before we get into that, let's talk about you growing up and what led you uh, to becoming an outdoorsman? You know, it was always in me uh, from really young uh, to be in the outdoors. I always thought about log cabins and Mm -hmm. being in the mountains. And we lived in California for four years when I was growing up. uh, And that was basically from kindergarten through third grade. Mm -hmm. And I remember this guy taking me fishing up in, I think it was the Kings River. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was this older guy and we were on these big boulders, you know, we had walked out there and we were fishing out on this thing. And, uh, it was just, it felt like heaven to Mm -hmm. me. And, uh, but we always lived in the city always. Right. And, and so there wasn't that opportunity. And my dad, he, he wasn't necessarily an outdoorsman. Mm -hmm. He was into what he was into, you know, and, and, you know, we loved him. We had a great home and stuff, Mm -hmm. but and he, but he did take us fishing every once in a while. Right. Uh, but he didn't necessarily teach us, uh-huh. you know. He prayed the fish on the line. That's he. Instead of actually knowing how to catch fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Ty was with us one time. We weren't catching any fish at all. And then all of a sudden he prayed and within five seconds. We, okay. So we were trolling in this aluminum boat. And this is probably the last, the last time he ever visited here. Yeah. Um, and he, he was adamant. He's like, I want to go fishing. And we, I remember we kept telling him, like, I kept saying, grandpa, like, this is a tough little boat to get into. Like, I don't know if you want to try. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm here. We're going to go fishing. Um, and we got him into this little aluminum boat and we caught a few fish at the beginning. And then we had this long stretch for probably two hours where we weren't catching anything. And both, both you and I were complaining Mm-hmm. And he's in the back of the boat and finally he gets all fired up and he goes, you know, what's the problem? Neither of you have any faith. Uh, <laughs> he goes, ne- you don't have any faith. And he goes, why don't we just pray to catch some fish? Yeah. And we both rolled our eyes. Like, yeah. that's it not how like, this works. Yeah. God doesn't care if we catch fish. That's how I was thinking. And then he goes, heavenly father, he goes, in the name of Jesus, put some fish on our line. <laughs> And within two minutes, he had a fish on and he caught multiple fish after that and we didn't catch anything. So that's how he fished. He had, he prayed for the fish to get on his line and God honored those prayers. And, and for you and I, who didn't have faith, apparently we were fishless. That's crazy. (laughs) I always looked at it like that's kind of cheating, you know, (laughs) totally (laughs) because God answers our prayers, but at the same time, he doesn't really care. Right. We we have a fisher. Yeah. We have the ability to catch fish, uh, but apparently you don't need it if you're in God's favor and you and I were not that day. Right. (laughs) Or God wanted to teach us a lesson. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, uh, growing up in the city, we just didn't have the opportunity to Mm -hmm. hunt and stuff. We fished every once in a while, but you know, uh, it really wasn't learning opportunities. So, what er- everything changed for me when I moved to Hamilton, Montana. Mm. And what age was this? This was, I was uh, 19. 19. 19, one year out of high school. Paint the picture of where you were able to move to. Oh my gosh. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Going from city life, city boy to Montana, completely rural. Yeah. What was, what what was the scenery like where you were at? Well, I happened to move to Hamilton, Montana because there was a Bible school there Mm -hmm. and I went to Bible school uh, for close to three years and, you know, kind of trained in that setting and stuff. But during that time I met my wife, Mm -hmm. um, she's from Canada. Mm -hmm. Don't hold that against her. (laughs) 
everyone does. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, getting over to Hamilton, it was like beautiful. The Bitterroot River runs all the way from uh, around Missoula and, mm-hmm. and, and runs down through that area. And there were huge brown trout, mm-hmm. you know, rainbows, uh, the best fish, some of the best fishing, fly fishing, mm-hmm. you know, you could get. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. How many um, how many acres did you move? Like you had your own private acreage when you moved there, yeah, right? That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was such beautiful area. I didn't get there right away. Uh-huh. Uh, I lived. <clears throat> uh, Curl and I got married, and that's my wife. Mm-hmm. And and we, uh, it, it was about three years before we moved out to this property mm-hmm. that had. 320 acres Mm -hmm. of just the most gorgeous land, big lodge pole and uh, every part of it, you could see animals everywhere. Gosh, There were elk and deer Mm -hmm. and bobcat and bear Mm -hmm. and three ponds in the front uh, with, with rainbow trout and cutthroat. Gosh. And then in the back, there was a moose pond. We called it the moose pond because yeah. every time you went back there, it's like you saw mm-hmm. moose mm-hmm. in there, unless it was, you know, winter and iced up. Right. Uh, yeah. It was just absolutely gorgeous. So here I That's am awesome. on this land mm-hmm. and I move in there and have no idea about the whole hunting thing. Right. And at this time, there was no hunter safety, especially in Montana. Um, no one, if, if no one's taught you how to do any of this stuff, you're basically given a gun and a tag and saying, go shoot these animals and you can harvest them and do whatever you want. So you had to figure out a lot of stuff yourself. Yeah. That's basically the way it was. Mm-hmm. There were, uh, there were tons, there were herds and herds of deer mm-hmm. everywhere. And white tail mule deer, mainly white tail where this was, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, where we lived on the 320, mm-hmm. there were mule deer came right down to where the white tail were, mm. and in that area, we'll talk maybe a little bit about okay. that later. Uh, but the first time I ever went hunting, there were two guys from Minnesota who said, Mike, you have got to get out there. They couldn't get their tags because they weren't in Montana long enough. You, mm-hmm. had, you had to be in Montana, I think, for six months and mm-hmm. have residency. Mm-hmm. And they weren't there long enough, but they wanted me to get out mm-hmm. because they were such big hunters. Right. And they and they just went up with me. And so we didn't even ask. We just went on this private property <laughs> 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 because we just, I didn't know. Right. And, and these guys probably <laughs> knew. Uh, but they didn't care. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we heard later that if the rancher would have caught us, uh-huh. it would have been real, bad, <laughs> real bad. <laughs> so here I am, you know, not knowing anything about hunting, mm-hmm. but loving the outdoors. Did you even know where to shoot a deer? Uh, I, you know, they told me okay. just try to get behind the shoulder. Okay. <laughs> you know, right. And the first deer you, you know, that comes up because in Montana, the first three days back then, I think it was 84, 85, uh, you could get doe or buck oh, okay. the first three days. Yep. And so when I came to Idaho, they had youth hunts were like that, but not for adults. Right. So anyways, no hunter training. No, I didn't even cite the 30, 30. And they just <laughs> said, you know, it was open sites. Yep. So just do your best. <laughs> So these deer come, you know, over and they're watching these deer and they're down a little ways below me Mm -hmm. and they're watching these deer and all these bucks were coming. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was about 10 huge, like five by five, six by Mm -hmm. six. One was like an, like a seven by seven, eight by eight, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, just monsters. Mm -hmm. Only bucks you find on private property. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> that you're not allowed to hunt. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I never saw them because uh-huh. the does were coming up. So I'm watching the does and they said, shoot the first one <laughs> that gets close yep. enough to you. Yep. Right. 
And so this first, the, these does come at me, and there was probably about six does, mm-hmm. and I never saw the bucks. They were kind of around the ridge from me, and the guys that came with me, they were down where they could see these bucks mm-hmm. just right around the corner. So they were going, wait, wait. <laughs> they and, and I couldn't hear them. Right, right. <laughs> and so this front, the front doe, you know, just comes right out, and uh, I shoot it. Uh-huh. Uh, it goes down, mm-hmm. and they're like, Mike, you dummy. (laughs) Did you see all these bucks? And so I look, and all these bucks are running over the ridge, you know, Uh after I shot. And I said, but I got my deer. They go, we don't care. (laughs) Well, that's actually a good mentality to have is for you, it's about I'm getting a deer. It doesn't, you know, it's the first deer that you've ever even shot at. So for you, your mentality is good, but for experienced hunters who are watching all these, you know, bucks that they never get to see, uh, (laughs) it's pretty devastating. Exactly. (laughs) So, uh, I had no idea what to do with that deer. Mm -hmm. Uh, they helped me gut it out, you Mm -hmm. know, and then I brought it home and they said, well, you can kind of hang it in a tree if you want, or, Mm -hmm. You can do whatever. I ended up plopping it on the kitchen table <laughs> with my Canadian wife, who she was going to kill me. <laughs> it stayed there for three days because I didn't know what to do with right, it. Right, right. Yeah. So no one taught you. No. So I. Why didn't to, those guys even show you what to how to butcher they didn't it? Show me anything. Wow. They were so mad at me because uh-huh. I killed a doe. Right. They just left you. <laughs> <laughs> they left me. They left me hanging. Yep. These guys were really funny. Guys right. Right. From Minnesota and and uh, good guys. But so that started my hunting experience. Mm-hmm. But he, I'm a city guy. I right. know nothing. Right. About this stuff. So the next year I actually bought a rifle mm-hmm. and I got a 30 out six, a semi-automatic 30 out six, which I've never even, I've yeah. never seen anyone shooting a semi-automatic yeah. and nobody rifle. Should. Yeah. Nobody should. That's just starting out right? <laughs> <laughs> because you know, that the gun sometimes would jam on me mm-hmm. and here I am a complete novice. I just have no earthly idea about rifles and stuff Mm -hmm. and and i did take it down to the range and i did sight it in and do all the stuff but i just didn't know a whole lot about it right and so um uh one time when i was trying to fix it when it jammed on me i i shot and i think i shot a deer that year Mm -hmm. it was like the next year or the year after uh and uh it jammed on me. So mm-hmm. I'm sitting there going like this, pointing the barrel at my head, you know, and all this stuff. <laughs> yep. And then all of a sudden it goes off. Oh my gosh. And, and it scared me so bad that when it went off, I threw the gun like this. Yep. Right. And, and, and backed up because it went right by my head. Gosh. And I, you know, somebody should have grabbed a hold of me and said, Mike, you have no earthly idea. What yeah. You're doing. Well, I mean, it speaks volumes to the, like, I've never, I, I've had some friends who are idiots who, who've, <laughs> who've had their gun go off on them, but it's so rare uh, if you've gone through proper hunter's education or you've had some sort of mentor, yeah. you know, teach you everything. Absolutely. Like you teaching me never point, even, even just hiking protocol. Like when you're hiking with someone, you never point your gun towards them while you're hiking, even though there's a tendency to want to do that um, because it's easier or more comfortable or whatever. But pointing your gun off to the side, pointing it behind you, pointing it in any direction except where the person is. uh, And yeah, obviously not looking down the barrel of the gun to try to fix something. Oh my God. But no one teach, if no one teaches you that you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And, um, I'm I'm really big on hunter safety mm-hmm. now when I look back on it. Mm-hmm. And with you, I tried to be as safe as possible, yeah. you know, with things. But still, I when we started hunting together and mm-hmm. you started coming with me and stuff, mm-hmm. it was like I knew that I wasn't this big hunter that knew everything. I thought you were. Uh, <laughs> Till I was like 16. It was just, it was just fun to me. Yeah. You know, getting right. out stuff. Yeah. That's and, gotta be a trip when your kid starts hunting with you. Yeah. I'm, I, um, I, for those who don't know, I have a, uh, 16 week year old little baby girl and all I can do is envision 
what it's going to be like for hunting and fishing for her later. And if she's even interested in that. And I get like excited just thinking about that. Um, so when it actually happens, it's gotta be a trip, right? Like why, what, I don't even know if I would care about hunting for myself at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I hope she, like, I hope that she loves to get out mm-hmm. in the wilderness and at least comes on the hunt, mm-hmm. you know, whether she shoots or not, that's mm-hmm. up to probably. So you obviously her. didn't shoot your face. I um, didn't shoot my face or my ear off, uh-huh. uh, but it, there was ringing for quite a long time. <laughs> and it was probably, it was probably one of those experiences where you now have a whole new respect for the rifle. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I actually have to be careful with this. Even though I do, I know you have a couple uh, stories of your guns going off, um, or at least people, <laughs> guns going off with other people. Um, didn't you have a guy who his gun went off in the car? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was I. I was youth pastoring at the time, and uh-huh. so I had all these youth around me, and it was great to just hang out with them mm-hmm. and develop relationship and stuff. And and we we had a great time. And I took this one kid out, Zach. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was one of his first times getting out. He had taken all his hunter safety stuff, you Mm -hmm. know, and was really safe. And his mom was this, uh, this, this gal, very overprotective. Mm -hmm. And she was a little bit leery about me taking him out hunting, (laughs) you know, with rifles. Uh (laughs) And so we were in my little Toyota pickup and uh, going, winding around this mountain road. And, um, my gun kind of, it was by the console in between us. Yep. And because it was a semi automatic, <laughs> you know, and I thought. Was this was your a, gun or his gun? It was my gun. Okay. This was my gun. <laughs> and so I just reached down to push it up uh-huh. and I must have hit the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, I have a hole in the bottom of my Toyota pickup truck. <laughs> and this thing went off and both of us were like, ah. and a little clip of something came up and hit Zach uh-huh. like right here mm-hmm. on his face. And I don't know what it was. Yep. And I, uh, but anyways, his mom freaked out. I bet. On me. Yeah. <laughs> Bullet fragment hit him in the face. Yeah. But in Montana at that point, it was like when you saw a deer and you were going down these roads and you could see one around any corner. Mm-hmm. There were so, there was so much game during that time. Right. And, um, so yeah, we, we, we were used to just grabbing our rifles, running off the road and, <laughs> right. And taking a shot off the hood. Yeah. Yeah. Taking a shot off the hood or, yep. or, or running up by a tree and mm-hmm. trying to get a rest and, you know, shooting something. Right. Right. Uh, so anyways, that was kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, I've had all kinds of things happen. Oh to yeah. Me, yeah. But when I think, I think it's good for a lot of hunters to hear this because I think a lot of hunters experience these types of crazy things that happen and it's a learning experience and hopefully they're safe through it all. They practice at least the barrel always being in a different position, but sometimes you try to take easy ways, you know, you try to take the easy way of like, I can jump out of a vehicle and shoot something right off the road. And now there's laws against shooting off the road for, for good reason, for these reasons. Right. Um, Tell me a little bit about your your first big buck, your first buck that you, I know you have a few good whitetail mounts, so tell me about your first hunt of your first Probably whitetail. Probably my nicest one, and so we lived on this, uh, the ground, it was 320 acres of prime, beautiful property that I uh, discussed just a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. And I was on the, and it backed up to BLM. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't, you did, unless you had permission, you couldn't hunt on my property, which nobody had permission mm-hmm. to hunt on this particular property. And, um, and then BLM was behind it. And mm-hmm. so I had the Lost Horse River running right behind that went onto our property. Mm-hmm. And then it was just, it was just open land. Wow. Back behind there. That's and awesome. so I had access to a place where the mule deer would come down and cross with the, the white tailed deer yep. and just, it, it was so unbelievable because every corner that you turn back there, mm-hmm. you could run into a herd of deer or you could see the biggest buck you've ever seen. Right. That's awesome. Uh, and so there was this one time I was going right by the lost horse uh, river and it, you know, and it, it's just a small river, but it went right into the Bitterroot river. Mm-hmm. 
And um, I had seen a scrape there the, the day before. And, and this was one of the last years I was in Montana. I think it was 1990. Uh, yeah, 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was one years old at you, the time. Yeah, you, you would have been one. Yep. And um, I was walking down the river, and then all of a sudden I just felt like I was supposed to stop. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was one of those moments, one of those picture-perfect moments when – when the whole setup, I had I had gone a little bit away from that scrape, mm-hmm. but I was just kind of hanging around in that vicinity. I was down a little ways, and so I I think the the wind was coming right at my face, mm-hmm. and then uh, I looked up and I heard this little trickling in the leaves, and then all of a sudden this huge bug <laughs> comes out, and it's literally thirty, not thirty yards, thirty feet. Mm-hmm. From me. Wow. Didn't know I was there uh-huh. at all. And uh, just, was it still open sight rifle? No, this was, uh, I had my scope. So <laughs> I was could be worried about that too yeah, because right. I was so close uh-huh. and ended up shooting this buck. And, and it had been a good year, you know, hunting uh, before that. I had seen stuff, but I was waiting for this like this type of buck mm-hmm. and it was a nice five by five and i've got this rack i don't know if ty if you have a photograph of it or, we'll, t- we'll get one we'll yeah, put it up for everyone uh, later on but uh yeah and uh i think you did a mount of the a european mount yeah okay this one yeah i got yeah. i got one of those plastic mounts that you can put on because i i think the antlers were just starting to fall apart weren't they yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, they were. So I think we screwed them into a, a plastic mount. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Yeah, so that was the biggest buck that I got in Montana, mm-hmm. and it's and it's a typical white tail, mm-hmm. uh, but nice big main beam, and it, it wasn't super wide at mm-hmm. all, not like the mule deer, but uh, it, it 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 was definitely one of the nicest bucks, right? And it was uh, probably two twenty five. Yep, that's awesome. You know, as far as poundage, that's goes. cool. Yeah. But before that, I had an experience. Yeah. <laughs> so I know Ty wants to get to so this. So this is this is the main story. <laughs> this is the main one. Um, and I've heard about this story from the guy that was with you, um, and he's he's told it to a bunch of people, but he didn't know all the details either. It, it, you know, you just get little tidbits here and there, and you've been pretty embarrassed to tell the story. Oh yeah. And somehow I've convinced you to to do it today. And to keep in mind, everyone, this this is coming from someone who came from city life, has never experienced hunting, except for the couple years that he's been self-teaching himself on private property. Um, and so there's gonna be some people who are super <laughs> judgmental about this. How could this how could this ever happen? Yeah. But it's just a different world back then compared to what hunting is now. Um, and so I'm excited to hear about the time that my dad shot a steer. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer's steer oh, from yeah. next door. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, how is this possible? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no easy way to defend myself. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you could shoot, could you shoot deer or elk at that time? Yeah. yeah. And either sex? In Montana, sex, you could. Either sex? No, you only could, uh, the first three days you could shoot uh, a doe mm-hmm. for deer. Was it at least the first three days? It w- no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm ready for this so, story. Uh, where we were was really brushy, mm-hmm. and we were on the 320. Mm-hmm. And and I, I I I wish I had a picture of this property so I could describe the whole <laughs> setting. Right. Because we were in the one swampy area that was right up from the three ponds, mm-hmm. and that little stream ran down into these three ponds mm-hmm. and then went off of the property mm-hmm. uh, to everybody else's. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, all the ranchers uh, had water from this. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, it was real swampy in there, and so I'm 
you know, literally you could go around any corner and see something on this property. Right. Deer, elk, so you're always on edge yeah, thinking something's going to pop out at, a, at certain times. I had missed some huge bucks mm-hmm. just because I wasn't ready. Right. I wasn't, I was walking to my area mm-hmm. where I thought I was going to hunt mm-hmm. and I would see something beforehand, you know, be that was just incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was used to just, uh, trying to be prepared to get my rifle up, you know, mm-hmm. and get the scope on it and just shoot. Right. And so I wasn't even thinking at all when I crossed, there was this little bridge that <laughs> went over the swamp mm-hmm. and it kind of crisscrossed over this swamp where you could get to the other side. And, uh, you know, I'm not even thinking <laughs> <laughs> at all, obviously. Yeah. I was an idiot. <laughs> Uh, so I, I cross this bridge and I'm over on the other side and I'm waiting for my buddy to come, which is his first time I went out hunting with this mm-hmm. guy. And he was actually plinking off grouse on the other side of the bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he shot one time and all of a sudden I see this movement mm-hmm. and it was gray uh-huh. and it was in, in front of a tree, but I couldn't see anything except for, I knew that it was the chest Mm -hmm. of the biggest buck I had ever (laughs) seen in my life. (laughs) So you were going off of pure, like the size, the size of this thing, the mass of this thing. There's no way it could be a doe. It's got to be the biggest buck ever. And you're not going to let it escape. Exactly. (laughs) That's, that's it. And (laughs) so I put the crosshairs on the chest of this thing and I, and I'm thinking, I am not going to let this thing take off. Right. Uh, and because this guy was plinking off grouse over here, they lunged, they lunged forward just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it was not only one deer, it was several, but I'm thinking I'm looking at the biggest deer body (laughs) that I've ever (laughs) come in contact with. (laughs) So I put the crosshairs on it and I shoot my 30 out six and I'm going, this is a good shot. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, when I shot, this thing lunges forward and goes, <laughs> and it was a cow. And I, my heart dropped, and I went, oh, my gosh. I wasn't even thinking of a cow being on the property. There right? weren't supposed to be any on they the property at the time. Yeah, the, the guy was supposed to take them down to the butcher shop and mm-hmm. get these – I think it was four steers. Yep. He was supposed to take them down. He got so I three of them out of there and missed <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. So he took that one to the butcher shop that day. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I had to pay for the butchering. I bet you did. And it was a friend of mine, you know, and he was like, Mike, how in the world did you shoot my steer? <laughs> And so as much as I tried to explain, uh, uh, there's no, no explanation, no, no explanation. <laughs> it, it was so dumb. But again, you're looking at somebody who came from the city yeah. and just, I, you know, when you start getting into the whole hunting thing and you start shooting game, it's like you realize the opportunities that are missed because mm-hmm. you're not prepared and, right. and, and all that stuff. But Well, and there's a reason that every single state now requires hunter safety yeah. and it's for these types of stories. Um, and it's good learning lessons to tell other people about this is a possibility. If you're not prepared, right. if you, if, if someone hasn't trained you properly or you feel uncomfortable in the wilderness, Something like this can happen. Absolutely. Um, so it's a good, it, I know it's embarrassing, <laughs> but it's a good learning experience for a lot of people on the importance of, of hunter safety and having that mentor, right. uh, that mentor in the forest. Okay. So right. some detail questions that I have that people have asked me, how did you get this steer out? Uh, you know, we could drive right to it because there was a road, gotcha. a, a gravel road that mm-hmm. went all the way around this property. Mm-hmm. Uh, and did so you load the thing we, up whole? No, <laughs> no, they had to, they had to cut it up a yeah. little bit before okay. they put it on there. Uh-huh. And, uh, that was the most humiliating thing. And we had, eight, what did your guy, had what did the guy guys. with you say? We had eight guys. No way. We had eight guys. And, oh, there was only one that was hunting with me yeah. that day, but there were eight guys that came out <laughs> to get the steer in the back of the truck. 
so we could take it to the butcher shop. <laughs> was your head just down the entire time? Oh, I, that was the most humiliating thing. Yep. But did he give and, you any meat? Uh, he actually gave me a steak. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he gave me uh, one of the back straps. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah it was, and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Best tasting, huge <laughs> beer, yep. beer cow <laughs> that I've ever had. That's so yeah. Funny. But it, you know what? It, it was all a learning experience. And then, so you know, as time went on, mm-hmm. you know, it it really made me always think, you know, hey, what you know, is it the right setup? Mm-hmm. You know, are you safe? Yep is are you sure nobody else is around right um are you shooting at the right thing (laughs) because you know all i saw was this this cow's chest because Mm -hmm. it was just in front of the tree and there were bushes back behind it right and all i saw was the lunge forward when this guy shot (laughs) and so i got a good shot on it oh yeah probably right (laughs) through the heart (laughs) it was a great shot. i mean the heart on a steer is like this big yeah yeah, and he, he went down right away, just lunged forward and gave up the ghost. Oh gosh. gosh. Yeah, well, but the, it helped me a lot later. Well, and you're, it seems like you're the type of person, especially people who've heard you preach and stuff like that, um, it seems like all life lessons for you come the hard way. Yeah. And this is this is a hard way to learn, okay, I need to, I need to really make sure I know what I'm shooting at. Absolutely. <laughs> you learn by two ways. You learn by wisdom. Mm-hmm. Of listening to other people's stories and 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 really taking that in or experience, yeah, and, and that's the hard knocks. Well, and hopefully people can listen to this and and think twice the next time they're about to just pull the trigger on something in the forest. Because true. honestly, I think we all as hunters have been there where you you have these animals evade you so many times, especially when you're hunting in forests and you're trying to be stealthy walking through the forest Mm -hmm. and you have these animals dart through and you think if I would have been prepared, I could have taken that shot, but is it worth it? If you end up shooting the wrong thing, even if it were, even if it were a deer, but it didn't have antlers and it wasn't the time of season, you know, or maybe it was an elk and not a deer. Uh, there's all types of scenarios that this can apply to someone to just take a breath, take a breath, think about it for a second and, and, and realize the shot that you're about to make. And if it's a good ethical shot. Absolutely. So I think, I think people listening to this can learn from it. Absolutely. Um, and we're dedicating this skull to this first episode. <laughs> this is going to remain on set. Uh, this is the, the prime premiere story <laughs> of the first episode and we're going to oh, continue man. to add to the set as some of these stories come up i'm sure we'll end up with broken fishing poles i know i have a story of a broken antler so it'll we'll slowly be building to this set of of mistakes that that hunters make and and it's all it's all for learning experiences yeah um so fast forward you uh you have two kids me and vanessa my sister uh, we moved to Idaho and, and, uh, we end up moving to one of the most gorgeous places I think in the United States in Sun Valley, Idaho, uh, which we're still in. And, uh, and my first outdoor experience that I can actually remember, and I know that I fished in those ponds in Montana, but I don't remember them. The first experience that I actually remember was fishing on the Bigwood river. And I remember looking at this big pool um, as a kid, and I think I think I had this little Spider Man fishing pole, it was um, lime green, lime green Spider Man <laughs> fishing pole. <laughs> and I remember you were trying to help me catch a fish. The whole day was like, how do I get Tyler to catch a fish? And I don't know if we'd caught any yet. Well, we went down there and, and, um, we were looking at it and I was trying to find the right place Mm -hmm. because you were still pretty little. You were four years old. Right. And this is like a, it's a pivotal moment for if we don't catch a fish, is he going to be bored of this? Is he not going to want to do it? That would be my mindset. Yeah, it really was. Like you have to catch that fish. That first fish is going to be the big, is he going to pursue this? Is he not going to pursue this? Does he want to be an outdoorsman or not? And Um, from my perspective, I remember you walked across, you were looking in this pool 
and you can tell your version of the story because they're probably a little bit different. But I remember you were looking into this pool and you ended up crossing the river and you were looking down on the other side. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I was looking on the other side. Yep. Um, you can correct there, there me. A, you can correct me if you remember because I was four or five. I don't remember anything. Yeah. There was a bend in the river, which mm-hmm. caused a little pool mm-hmm. uh, right there. So it was deeper. Yeah. And so I knew there was some fish in there. Yeah. And it was June when we moved here mm-hmm. into the uh, Wood River Valley. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was June. And so the river, it, although it was uh, rushing pretty good, mm-hmm. uh, because we could get into this pool, uh, yeah, the, it, it was, uh, I, I knew you were going to catch fish. Yeah. And so this is my first outdoor experience, my first memory of it. And I remember... Uh, you telling me to cast my worm right into this little pool. And so I threw my worm and I just sat there and waited. And I remember feeling something tugging, but I didn't know how to reel. (laughs) I didn't know how to reel in. I didn't know how to do anything. I just knew there was a fish online. And I think you were still across the river trying to get to me. Is that correct? Uh, I was actually behind you a little ways. Because I remember you were like, reel it in, reel it in. And I didn't know what to do. And I just threw it on my shoulder and just ran it onto shore. And it was this big 18-inch fat, was it a rainbow or brown? The first one you caught was a 19-inch brown. Brown. And it was a big fish. And I I remember you like giving me the biggest hug. And I just remember you (laughs) like the, the proudness of a father of like, you did it. Good job. Like I I remember just being completely filled with endorphins at the time of, Oh, this is, this is going to be something that I want to do in life. I, I want to catch another one. I want to catch another one. Um, and I really feel like that moment solidified for me that I'm going to pursue fishing and hunting and being in the outdoors and, and then later leading it to all being all about the meat, collecting meat for my family. But if I didn't have that experience, I wonder what it would be like. I may not have found interest in hunting and fishing. I might have just continued to be a, you know, I, I mean, later in life I became a video editor, but that could all been just me, a nerdy video editor, no hunting, no fishing, no outdoor stuff. If I didn't have that experience. Yeah. Um, so thank you for, yeah, no problem. <laughs> thank you for giving me that. Uh, and I think all, you know, if you are an outdoorsman, if you hunt, if you fish, or even if you're not, but you want that for your kids, get them in the outdoors, get them to experience stuff like that. The same way that you may not play baseball, you may not play basketball, but you see the importance of getting your kids into sports. Um, I think it should be the same for some of these, some of these families who are interested in the outdoors for their kids, get them to experience it, see if they want to pursue it. Uh, Because to me, it, put so much purpose in my life. Uh, Every year, it's the thing I look forward to. Everything is a (laughs) buildup to hunting season or to bass tournaments. Uh, You know, everything's a buildup to that. Um, So I think, I think that that's super important. Uh, I have a couple more stories I want you to tell uh, of you and I hunting. Um, Uh, Let me say something just real quick. Go for it. Go for it. Real quick. you know, when we first got here to the Wood River Valley, uh, I had no idea really what to expect. I knew that it was a big a resort area, you mm-hmm. know, and that uh, my Canadian wife would love the downhill ski <laughs> right. uh, because she came out of the womb skiing. <laughs> and um, But I wanted my son more than anything, which uh, Tyler's a little bit older than Vanessa, but it was really important for my son and, and my daughter too mm-hmm. uh, to enjoy the outdoors Mm -hmm. and um i really wanted tyler to be a a football player which later (laughs) on he came to that place uh he didn't enjoy the football thing like i did yeah Uh, but too much running oh my gosh (laughs) but he was so good at it you Mm -hmm. know in in what he did and so when we first got here to the valley the first thing I did was we unloaded the truck. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you, you, you wouldn't have remembered no. this at all, but uh, we went directly down to the river. Really? Yeah. That's you, awesome. You got your little lime green. I think I went to the store that day. Wow. And got you a little lime green 
because we didn't fish in Arkansas mm-hmm. before we got here. And that's where we were. We went from Montana to Arkansas, Arkansas only for about a year. And then we came here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I went down and purchased this little lime green fishing pole mm-hmm. uh, for Ty mm-hmm. and he went down to the river and uh, it was important mm-hmm. that you catch something. And so that, that was the first the day whole, being here? That was the first day being wow, here. Wow, that's awesome. And, and I asked uh, the guy where we were staying, I said, where's a good fishing spot? He said, Mike, it's it's good fishing mainly all down through here. Mm-hmm. And he said, but you can go a little bit south of Bellevue. You know, mm-hmm. da, 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 da. I'm not going to tell any of the Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> So we went down there, and sure enough, we went down this little uh, path that he was talking about, and Tyler went down there and caught, you not only caught the 19-inch brown, but Mm -hmm. you got this, uh, I think it was an 18-inch rainbow. Mm -hmm. And so we're carrying these two fish, Mm -hmm. you know, in our our nice car Mm -hmm. that we drove down, (laughs) (laughs) and and, and back there, and you were hooked. Yeah. You were hooked from that time. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really important for both of my kids to somehow enjoy the outdoors. Vanessa does through snowboarding or skiing, Mm -hmm. skiing mainly. Uh, And she's gone with you hunting a few times. Yeah, she went with me hunting, and I saw more game with her than I've ever seen. But She's like grandpa. She's blessed. Yeah, she is. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, please. She was actually in a walking boot when Uh I took her out. Really? Yeah. Yeah, she was a diehard. Yeah, we camped out that night. You know, we just had a great experience. That's awesome uh, with the whole hunting thing. But it was important for both of my kids, mm-hmm. anyways, to have that uh, experience in the outdoors. And I have to say this now before Tyler goes on, he might be going somewhere else with this mm-hmm. whole thing. But uh, uh, it was it was so important uh, for me. Uh, because it's led us to what we are now mm-hmm. with hunting. The, you know, I love hunting and I've gotten a lot of deer through the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't gotten as many elk, but I have to say my son is so much better of a hunter than I am. <laughs> and he knows where to go. He it really studies it out. He goes, you know, uh, up to all these, uh, you know, different places that I never went. I put in a lot of time now. Oh, yeah. You but you're still prepared. more blessed than I am because even though I put in all this time to get these animals, you still somehow shoot bigger bigger deer than me. Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm not putting in for the tags and stuff, but in the general hunts yeah. and stuff, I, I, I do feel blessed. Yeah. I'm gonna, I've got a few big deer. Let's tell that story. The, <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest mule deer that you ever took... Um, and it's a it's a non typical points points going everywhere. I think yeah, it's yeah. a what a seven by nine something like yeah. that. It had all kinds of little <laughs> cheaters and yeah. stuff on there. So that year, you had actually went on vacation. You went to Hawaii, I think, yeah. uh, during hunting season. Which At the I was like, yeah, you were that's furious. a that's a that's a cardinal <laughs> sin in in my <laughs> book. Um, but you went hunting and or, or you went to Hawaii. I had been hunting all year. Um, I think I had, uh, yeah, that's the year that I shot my big bull elk and you were there at the beginning of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember I found this herd of deer, uh, 15 bucks in this herd Mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't believe it. And, and I knew no one was going up there. I hadn't seen any tracks. I hadn't seen anyone driving this particular road. Um, and, and I knew that it was, it was, this road had been shut down for a few years. So no one had been going on it. People didn't know it was open. And when I went up there and saw these 15 bucks, I was like, oh, all right, I'll wait for my dad to get back. Um, and you, you came back. Uh, and I think we went up, I think it was the last day of hunting season, October 31st mm-hmm. for deer. Yeah, it was. We had been hunting hard yep. before that. Yep. And we went up to this particular ridge, and that day I was feeling horrible. Oh, yeah. I hadn't gotten my deer yet, but I didn't even care. I'd gotten an elk that year. I knew I didn't need the meat. And I was super sick, and I basically said, you can walk down that ridge. I'll walk down this ridge, and uh, we'll meet at the four-wheeler. Um, and I... I remember I was supposed to hike this ridge and I didn't. I was so sick. I literally just walked right back down to the four wheeler and just sat there waiting for you. And I heard a gunshot off in the distance, probably half an hour later. And, 
And then I, I got a phone call from you. We happen to have service. Usually you don't have service in a lot of these places, but we happen to have service, very patchy service. And all I heard was you go, I got one. And I'm like, oh, great. How big is it? And you said a two by three. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just preface this too. With, it was a longer shot. And so I couldn't really see the hordes. You just I, knew I his last the day, horns. His I last knew day, a it's a buck. Yeah, it's a buck. Yeah, and I was like, why would you shoot a two by three? And I look up, literally while you were talking, I looked up on the ridge and saw some deer, and I saw a little two by two, two by three up there, and I was like, I'm off the road staring at a two by three. Why would you shoot a two by three <laughs> way back there? And you were like, I don't know. He looked pretty thick. <laughs> <laughs> And this drag, you guys, was awful. It was, it yeah. Was it, but we were at the bottom, and we were able to carry it all the way out to the road. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, so I am super sick. I He's trying to explain to me, because there's a bunch of different finger canyons that go out, and if you go up the wrong one, you could be miles away from, from the right spot. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to figure out which yeah. canyon you shot it in. Yeah. And so you were kind of describing it to me and I was like, okay, I think I know where that is. So I drive down the road and then I hike up and it's, it's a good mile and a half up this ravine to get to where you were at. And luckily I chose the right one, but I was sick the ent entire time. Oh, My I throat was so killing me, but I get up to you and all of a sudden I didn't feel sick anymore because I see this buck <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is your two by three. You, you were like, what the <laughs> heck are you talking about? It was a about? seven by nine biggest buck I've ever seen in real life at that point in front of me. You know, you see pictures of big deer, but a big, huge seven by nine in a spot that this buck should have never been in. But he was when you were walking up, you were about 30 feet from me uh -huh. and you, and you see it. And I go, I think it's a little bit bigger than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, and this thing is thick. We'll, we'll I'll put up a picture of it. Um, but yeah, I remember just being like, "This is the luckiest guy in the entire world." And I think, I think, I think, if, I don't know if this is true. Let me know what you think. But I think as you as you get closer to God in some of these things, sometimes God just throws you a bone here I, and there. I, that's what I feel. <laughs> <laughs> like Grandpa, when he gets to that age of, he can just pray for fish to jump on his line. I don't think that happens when you're young at all, but maybe it happens a little bit more as you get older. That's what I'm experiencing with some of these stories. Yeah. I just want, I, now it's, it's always like, I love the fact hunting with my son mm -hmm. and, and some of his buddies even, mm -hmm. uh, and imparting anything that I might have, mm -hmm. you know, as far as hunting skills. Uh, but I definitely, um, you know, uh, carrying out animals has yeah. been quite the thing. We yeah. Do. We, we drug that in. anytime I hunt by myself or with other buddies, I will always, uh, Oh, what's it called? Do I'll always use the gutless method where you take all, yeah. you take the animal apart, you put it on your back and you hike it out. That's always the easiest way for some reason when I'm with you, you convinced me to drag them out whole <laughs> And I have no idea how you convince. I told someone this year, only my dad could convince me to drag these animals out whole. This year, the this buck year. that I shot, we had a picture perfect uh, hunting experience this year. I shot this buck and you convinced me that, oh, we just got to drag it up this one ravine. We just got to drag it uphill this one ravine. Luckily it was snowy, so it was a little bit easier but we ended up missing this ravine that I was supposed to drag it up. And it was, it was 750 vertical feet up of okay. me just dragging yeah. my back went out as I was doing it. It took me five hours to get up to this Ridge. Yeah. It was at least 250 yards, up this ridge. <laughs> but the truck was just over on the other side. Right. So if we could just get it to that point yep. and Oh my gosh, we beef this crazy buck up <laughs> and it, this buck was 250 pounds. Yeah. It had to it was be a big buck. Yeah. Big body. Uh, and so we would just literally, we would grab it and go five feet. <laughs> And then, it, and then sometimes you would just get disgusted and go 10 feet, uh -huh. but then you were pooped for the next round. And yeah. it was like, oh my gosh, which is funny because there was a little snow on the ground. So that helped. Well, looking, I always, I'm with you. I love to hang a deer hole if you can. Yeah. It seems like 
you know, you can get as much scraps of meat off of it as you possibly can, but I love it when you can hang it for yeah. a, a little bit of time um, and take your time butchering it, especially when it's cold out. It's nice to butcher it in a nice warm environment uh, like your house while watching a movie. Mm -hmm. um, but a a looking back at it, any other method we would have done would have taken half the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No doubt. <laughs> There was this nice level field yep. uh, right below us, you know, and uh, <laughs> you can take it right out to the road, but you would have had to carry it quite a ways. You, mm -hmm. had, you had actually done that before. This was the second buck that you pulled out of there. Right, right. So we, you have one other good mule deer story. Um, and I was, I was probably 15 or no, I was probably 14, 14, 15, um, and we were driving out roads with Tracy Peterson. Oh gosh. Tracy Peterson, his daughter nuts. Lacey. I forgot about that. Um, and this is again, I, some of my friends still talk about they've never shot a buck as big as that mule deer. Perfect, typical four by four with nice big eye guards. Um, and my dad would always tell me, you would always tell me, you're here. You would always tell me. Um, sometimes these deer in, in the middle of the day will just hang out in these little cluster of trees. You'd always tell me that. And I'd be like, Quakey's this is, ass. this is ridiculous. We'd be sitting in the middle of the day, throwing rocks into Quakey, seeing if stuff, <laughs> <laughs> seeing if stuff jumps out. That's just not my style of hunting at all. Um, but I remember you would always tell me that. And now it is completely stuck in my brain because of this story. Um, you told, you said, we're going to go down and throw some rocks in these quakies. And I had zero interest in doing that. I sat in the truck and was like, I'm not, I'm not getting out of here. There's no deer in these, this little tiny patch of quakies. And you and Tracy were talking, throwing rocks into this, into this little patch and in, in open, this is an open unit, it is. uh, it public land. Open. And, uh, yeah, tell me what happened. Well, little, cause coolie, I wasn't there. Little coolies and, and Tracy, he drove his Ram truck up and down these, these, these things that I never would have taken my truck out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, he just felt pretty comfortable with that. And so we got to this one area and, you know, we're scoping around and stuff, not seeing anything. And so, you know, and it is the middle of the day, mm -hmm. um, probably one or two o'clock. Mm -hmm. And, um, all of a sudden, uh, I started tossing a few rocks down into these quakies and aspens. Mm -hmm. And uh, next thing you know, and Tracy does from the other side. Yep. So and, you guys are on the opposite sides throwing rocks into these quakies. Yeah. And it wasn't that big of an area at mm -hmm. all. You remember. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, if there was something in there, they were really hidden. Right. And then all of a sudden, this monster mule deer... <laughs> jumps out of the middle of these quakies mm -hmm. and it was unbelievable mm -hmm. it was a nice i i think was it a four by four or a five by five I it was a it, it was a five by five but it was because of the oh, big the eye guards our eye guards yeah. yeah yeah that's right technically fishing game calls it a five by five but most hunters in idaho would call it a four by four with big eye guards right and so both tracy and i are shooting at this deer because we both want it <laughs> and it jumped at first it jumped in between you guys yeah, right in between and so, so you, we didn't you're we weren't not shooting, shooting there <laughs> you learned from your cow story exactly <laughs> so it jumped a little ways away from us mm -hmm. and uh tracy is a is a good enough shot mm -hmm. to where he shot and while it was on the run mm -hmm. and I could tell he probably hit this thing first, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, when it stopped, we were both blasting <laughs> because this deer was so big and the rack was so big that I thought we can't let this get away. Right. And, uh, yeah, he went down probably about the third shot. Yeah. So. And I, we, I don't think Lacey and I were sitting in the truck. I don't think we even heard the gunshots. Really? No, I don't think so. I think you guys all of a sudden were coming up going, we got one. We got one. Yeah. And we're like, what? Yeah. How did you get one in that little patch of quakies? Yeah. Um, but that still is one of the prettiest, perfect, typical bucks that I've seen. It's a great mule deer. Yeah. We'll pop a picture up of that. Um, yeah. I remember, uh, we'll talk a little, we'll talk a little bit more and we'll wrap it up. Um, I remember the first time you took me hunting. Uh, I was 11 years old. So the next year at Idaho, now in Idaho, you can start hunting at 10, but at that time oh, you, really? yeah, at that mm -hmm. time you had to hunt at 12. 
Um, so I was 11 years old and you were taking me out for my first time. And to paint the picture, I had done no physical work on my body at all. At that time, I was 11 years old. I was super chunky, uh, no muscle. And you were concerned. How is he going to get up the mountains? And you came up with this idea of let's put cleats on him. <laughs> let's put football cleats on him. I thought this kid needs traction. <laughs> <laughs> so he can, so he could hike up these mountains. And I remember hiking up this mountain being miserable for, because I hadn't experienced physical activity at that time, except for, you know, playing in sports and stuff like that, but not where you're just hiking straight up a mountain and not understanding the, the, the hunting part of it. Yeah. And there wasn't any snow out at no. that particular time. It was October. But I remember those cleats, they were like tap shoes on the rocks. <laughs> And so every yeah, time I'd step up, it was click, 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 click. And you'd turn and be like, shh, shh. Like, and I, shut it, the heck up. <laughs> <laughs> click, 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 <laughs> shh, shh. And I remember finally feeling so just sad because I couldn't even hike right. And I'm, I'm shocked that I ended up getting into hunting oh, yeah. um, because that first experience was horrible. Um, but then, yeah, I don't even, I don't even know. I, I think, I think my first hunting experience went really well. Um, we hunted all, well, actually that's the year I shot that doe multiple times, uh, with oh, Kurt yeah, Tidwell. With Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm shocked. I ended up hunting after those first couple of years, uh, because those first few hunts were, were a learning experience as well, but, but it was I mean, awesome to have you and other guys who are friends of yours, there to mentor me through this, uh, through the whole process. And you had a good rest, you know, yeah. just take your time. Yep. And that, that it was a doe. The first one you yeah, got first, was a doe. First year I and got was a doe. you shot it in the head, didn't you? No, I shot it. So the first shot was in the front legs in oh, the, oh, it, yeah, right in right. the bottom. That's right. And the, I think the shot, it was probably how far of a shot. Gosh, I, you know what? Hundred yards. Hundred yards. We but, hadn't been in the area before, but it was pretty wide open and <laughs> where we were and stuff. And okay, so my first <laughs> shot at the age of twelve was only a hundred yards, which in in you know in the Midwest a hundred yards is a decent shot. In Idaho, a hundred yards is the easiest shot right. in the world. Right. Um, and I hit this doe in. I it was either the front legs or the back legs in the bottom, yeah. but it was a horrible, horrible experience, and I felt. At that time, I had so, I still do. I have so much sympathy for animals. I really care about the way that they're taken. And I shot the, and this, there was like probably 70 doe there. And that was the hardest part was trying to choose which one. Mm -hmm. But I also had Kurt, Brian, and you all watching me shoot at this doe. Um, shot, hit it in the bottom legs, and this thing would not stop. We ran down the mountain. I shot it again in the neck. Okay. And yeah. then it kept running. That's right. And we ended up stumbling across it later in later in the dark and Kurt had to jump on it and take care of it. Yeah. Um but I I was like mortified of the entire experience because I really did care about the animals and still do today. Um and ever since then I I really put it in my mind that I am going to make sure that I'm prepared and never do a shot like that. But don't you think that that prepared you for any other hunt that you totally. go on? Like everybody needs an experience like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a young kid that was hunting last year. Everything was picture perfect. Mm -hmm. Got a nice, got a nice deer. Had a good rest. Mm -hmm. Da 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 da. But this year it was different for him. Mm -hmm. His dad took him out, and it wasn't quite the shot that he thought. Yeah. and and so he had to see. You know, it, it was it was suffering. The animal was suffering a little bit, mm -hmm. and I think everybody needs to see that. And that's how important it is that you do get a good shot, right? That you put in the prep work. Yeah, because I that that experience is always in my mind. If I never want to have that happen again, and I'm sure I've had similar experiences that have happened since, but they're very few and far between. And usually it's always from a dumb mistake that I make that I knew mm. that I shouldn't have. Um, but I, I agree there has to sometimes, I think for all hunters, there's those stories 
that are a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. Mine happened to happen the very first time I ever tried to shoot at a deer. Um, but I think all hunters have that experience of, of, uh, I need to be prepared. And then, and then when they get relaxed, cause they think they're so good or they can shoot at anything, that's the year that it's going to happen again oh, yeah. for them. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, at what was, so I remember, um, I'd, I'd shot a few doe after this, um, each, I think when I was 12, 13 and 14, those were the years that I shot doe. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was 15 and I could finally drive, I remember I told you guys, uh, and, and still kind of shocked that you let me do this. But I remember when I was 15, 15 and a half, I still wasn't even legally allowed to drive at night. Um, I remember I told you, uh, Hey, I'm going to go hunting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to school. And you were like, what? Yeah, you are. You're going to school. And I was like, just let me, I just want to go hunting by myself on a weekday where there's not a bunch of people. And you said, all right, I'll, you can go. And so I remember I, I took off school that day and mom was mortified. She didn't even know until the next day that I was out in the mountains. Um, Better to ask for forgiveness later <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Um, and then I called you, uh, you know, a few hours after the morning and said, Hey, I, I got a buck. It was amazing. What was your feeling during that? I was the most proud dad because, you know, a kid walking up in the dark, uh, to a place that I had taken him a few times. So he, he kind of knew the area and stuff, but it was amazing. Uh, when you called and said, dad, I got one. And I was like, what? <laughs> How? How'd you do that? Yeah. I remember that feeling. It was a very similar feeling as when I caught that fish. Yeah. But when I shot a buck for the first time by myself yeah. and called you and said, I got one. And I think I'd gutted it out and was dragging it on the trail at that, at that time. Yeah. You, and, and I said, I'll meet you on the trail. Yep. And like, I was almost sprinting down the trail <laughs> to get to you. Uh -huh. Uh, knowing all the adrenaline mm -hmm. is pre-shot. Right. Once you shoot, and then it's like, oh, wow. Okay, yep. now the work starts. Right. But uh, I was just so proud mm -hmm. that you had gone out there by yourself, mm -hmm. done everything, and I thought, oh, man, he's going to far surpass me <laughs> uh, in stuff. Um, well, I still am yet to shoot. Uh, I've gotten a bigger elk than you. I'll just brag about oh, that yeah. for a second. Yeah. I've gotten a bigger elk. Um, I have not shot a bigger mule deer yet. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, I still haven't surpassed you yet. So you're still beating me there, but I do remember sure that you will. I do remember that being a defining moment as well for, okay, this is, I do want to, if I can do this by myself mm -hmm. and I don't have to have people here and I feel prepared enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and the shot was, the shot was perfect. The deer fell right where I shot. Uh, everything felt right and that this is what i wanted to pursue and do in my life um and and so yeah almost all the work that i do where i live is all geared for mule deer hunting specifically oh, yeah uh, and i've gotten into elk hunting and stuff like that but for me it's all about mule deer hunting yeah. um and i look forward to my daughter so you know seeing if that's an interest of hers yeah. if it's not it's fine i'm yeah. only gonna push it every day <laughs> Um, like I did with you with football. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I really pushed it with football and uh -huh. I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up playing and I, it was fun, but yeah, it's just nothing compared to hunting. There's something so primal for me about hunting and gathering your own meat. Oh, yeah. Uh, and to me, you know, when you're, as you're growing up, you're always looking at the biggest antlers, you know, trying, trying to get those trophies. But to me, at the end of the day, it is all about that meat and I have just as much fun hunting. Well, not just as much fun, but I have so much fun hunting, but I really love figuring out how to cook the meat mm -hmm. uh, in all the different ways, whether it's fish, deer, elk, whatever it is. Uh, that's also part of the fun and sharing those experiences, telling the stories of the animals that I shot or the fish that I caught while people are enjoying the food that I made uh, to me is, is, part of the entire experience. So you get to almost relive those experiences all year long. And now doing a podcast where I'm telling stories about hunting and fishing, I really get to live it yeah. all year long. Yeah. And so that's, 
it's, it's, it's exciting. Yeah, this is a great thing you're doing. Uh, Thanks. And I, I'm excited for future podcasts, seeing them. Yeah. And, and knowing all my buddies mm-hmm. will probably be on uh, yeah, the, totally. the, the podcast and telling their funny stories. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to keep having people come back on as new stories come up. If you and I go hunting this year and we end up with another story, uh, we bring you back on and tell that specific story. <laughs> if you shoot another steer, then we're for sure oh, telling not that. <laughs> <laughs> not unless it's supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not unless a farmer tells you, I need yeah, you to come out yeah. and shoot would my you, steer. Would you please put my steer down. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I know that that story was tough to, oh, tough to do, yeah, it's uh, still lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really appreciate you telling it. I know that people are going to enjoy it and learn from it and you'll probably get some, some, uh, negative comments from it, but who cares? Everyone's got this experience and, yeah. and yours good. is, yours is just, uh, it's, it's drastic. All <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on dad. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on.